Good morning and welcome to St. James Lutheran Church for our Sunday worship service here for September 12th, the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. And again, in our readings, we hear again from the Gospel of Mark as a part of our our uh, discipline of the, the lectionary, where we, we listen to, we, we go through scripture rather than simply picking and choosing whatever we, we like as our fancy from one Sunday to the next. Um, as we turn in our hymnals, though, for those of you with hymnals at home, uh, our Lutheran service book, we're going to be using the Order of Morning Prayer on page 295. And again, if you have your, if you're on our mailing list, then um, pull up the pull up the um, bulletin insert with our scripture readings and join in praying the collect prayer, especially together for us today. But as we begin um, remembering our baptism, let's begin by making the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us join together in praying the Collect Prayer for today. Lord Jesus Christ, our support and defense in every need, continue to preserve your church in safety. Govern her by your goodness and bless her with your peace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We say, Amen. Well, our gospel reading continues in Mark's gospel in chapter 9 here today, beginning at verse 14, verses 14 to 29. When they came to the disciples, okay, the people saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, when they saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to Jesus and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth, and it becomes rigid. And so I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of the people said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, growing up, you know, in this area of Edmonton, there was a bit of a charismatic influence within one of our parishes. And having just moved down from the small town where I was born and grown up with all of my friends, you know, I was kind of looking for a place to fit in. And one of my brothers was attending that particular parish at the time. The whole charismatic thing was pretty big, not only within that particular church, but, you know, you still find it running around in various denominations today so that, well, yes, there's Pentecostalism, which is big on, you know, casting out demons and various signs and wonders that they look for and try to do all the time. But I remember this particular passage was used in a kind of a way to teach, you know, almost like a how-to passage on how to cast out demons and where the problems lie. And if you don't have enough faith, it's not going to work for you and all these sorts of things along the way. 
The trouble is, you know, and as things kind of went on and Jesus comments at the end, you always get this kind of a works righteousness sort of a mentality that kicks in. You just have to pray harder, right? And we hear that in so many different preachers even today where faith is something where you name it and claim it or faith is a strong feeling or faith is a strong remembrance about these sorts of things and all these different ways of understanding what faith is rather than faith as turning our attention to our Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we trust in him. And as we look at that and as we listen, you know, I couldn't help but reflect upon that way in which it was taught and how it really did abuse this passage of Scripture in the context of all of Scripture because really it was one of those elements where we always try to insert ourselves into the grand scheme of things where we try to claim some sort of power for ourselves, sort of like Simon Magus when he was trying to talk to the disciples, give us that power too. And so he said, just I'll pay you some money and you should give me that power. And just in the way in which, well, it's far too easy to find even on Facebook, yes, I date myself with that, but any other social media and on the internet, any number of miracle courses that you can tie into so that you can perform your own miracles if just you have enough faith or you pray hard enough, and these kinds of things. It's an abuse of the text on so many ways if you look at that in this kind of a way. Because the whole point of the scriptures is not to point to what we are able to do, because in every case that we point to ourselves, really we discover that we stumble and we fall. It's that pridefulness that leads to our own personal fall along the way. But... Instead, the whole of the scriptures point to Christ, not only as the fulfillment of all of the promises of God, right from the beginning of Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation, but even here within our gospel text, so that as we listen to what's going on, as we consider what is going on, it points to faith and a faith which turns to Christ rather than a faith which says, let me do it because I think I've got enough skills to be able to handle this. Faith is not about skills. It's not even about how hard you pray, even though prayer is an important element of the Christian life. Faith is about trusting in what it is that Christ has done for us. So that here, as we listen to this whole passage, it's always important to recognize that faith, well, in the way that Jesus even talks about it, where he calls them a faithless generation, how long will I be with you? And then his answer is, bring him to me. Um, it's interesting that that line gets so easily overlooked. We always have that drive within ourselves instead of bringing our concerns and our worries and the needs within our lives to our Lord in order to have him not only comfort us in the midst of our trials and struggles, but to entrust him to unfold it in the way in which he determines is best. We have that DIY kind of a drive within our lives. Sort of like you've got all these DIY, do-it-yourself channels and programs and YouTube videos and all of these sorts of things that people look up. And even in the way in which people are dealing with the pandemic, so that rather than trusting the medical consensus that's out there and the doctors, well, you've got those do-it-yourselfers that go out and say, well, I can go and figure out what my own health needs and treat myself. And then you end up with all these people, you know, coming in with, well, the latest is the Invermectin um, poisoning cases that are being brought to all these different doctors throughout North America. It's like, really? Really? You know, it's become a pandemic of its own kind within our spiritual lives, within our attitudes about how we relate to one another, how we deal with our health, how we deal with COVID rather than trusting. Yes, for medicine, of course, we trust that the Lord works through doctors. Not some strange doctor that we've never heard of that's got an exotic name that claims to have found some sort of a corner on things, whereas, you know, the rest of the medical community has tested those claims and said, no, it doesn't work that way. We're not talking about that. You know, that's been something throughout the ages where, you know, you talk about something exotic from way far, far away land, in the Middle Ages, people, if you could claim that this little trinket that you brought from a faraway land had magical properties, everybody would be, you know, tripping over themselves in order to acquire it. 
Well, we still do that kind of crazy stuff in our world today. It's like Peter Popoff, one of these late night TV preachers who's been discredited many times, but then, you know, claimed to have, I don't know what his current shtick is, but he discovered a miracle spring in Siberia of all places, which nobody would ever go and verify because nobody would ever be able to go there. But if you send him some money, he'll send you a little drop in a vial, which will cure everything. No, it doesn't work like that. That's not faith. That's being duped by snake oil, you know, salesmen along the way. And here, as we listen to our gospel reading today, it's exactly the same thing where Jesus really is countering, well, the disciples do it yourself kind of a mentality and a spirituality where when the crowd and this fellow brought his son in order to be healed, he brought him for Jesus to see him, the disciples figured that they would be able to do it themselves. Jesus calls them faithless. He says, bring him to me. As we hear that, you know, it's one of these stark reminders for us in our own day and age where far too often we substitute a quest for some sort of spiritual power or spiritual attention or spiritual influence on the basis of our own strength rather than humbling ourselves before the Lord so that, like John the Baptist said, that we would decrease so that our Lord Jesus, he would increase. And as we hear and see this passage unfold, yes, finally, after the disciples were arguing amongst themselves and trying to figure out, well, you didn't do it right, or whatever the argument might have been, it would have been interesting to be a fly on the shoulder of one of those fellows there. Well, they bring him and Jesus calls them faithless and he says, bring him to me. And then he asks the father what's been going on and all these sorts of things. And it's fascinating how all of this revolves and centers and builds up to this marvelous point, which I do believe is the center of the passage. It's that confession of the father where he says, if you can do anything, please have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus' response is, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father cries out and he says, and I love this line, I always have. He says, I believe, help my unbelief. And that's perhaps really what is the most honest confession of faith here within this particular passage. And it's a good one for us to wrestle with and to make part of our own prayers where that desire to believe is there, yet we recognize that we stumble in it so often, where that desire to have that work of Christ brought into our lives in its fullness, and yet at the same time we have that do-it-yourself mentality where we try to insert ourselves so often and make, it, make faith in our entrance into heaven something that we do, or the way in which we take a look at, well, and this really does address the whole of our Christian lives, that call through repentance to humble ourselves before the Lord so that we open our hands not only to give him our brokenness, the thing that he desires, our broken hearts, to trust in him and his word rather than to say, but I want you to do it my way. Help my unbelief. What a beautiful prayer. What a beautiful culmination of this whole passage. And yes, as Jesus casts out the demon, certainly that is there at the end and the close of this passage. And then the disciples ask him, well, why couldn't we do that? And he says, well, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. It's not prayer in the sense of bigger certainty or prayer in the sense of stronger emotions, but it's prayer in the sense of turning to our God who does all things including working out our salvation so that we entrust ourselves to him and his working in our lives. That's that prayer of humility. So that as we wrestle with whatever it is that we have before us, as we wrestle with the worries and fears of COVID or of where the government is going or of the economy or of the environment or of you name it, we need to recognize that the anchor is Christ. The cornerstone 
of our salvation is Christ. The cornerstone is Jesus who steps right into the midst of where we are and he gives himself to us in order to be the one that does that battle for us. If only, if only we would learn through the working of the Holy Spirit to leave that old DIY spirituality behind. Because that DIY way of looking at things is always rooted in our own, well, broken, selfish, and sinful self. Now, help my unbelief. That's the most honest statement here, and it's a beautiful prayer for us to bring into this week. And I really encourage you to make it a part of your prayers as you take a look and use that prayer and use that portion of Scripture to turn our attention back to Christ our Savior. And as for demons, well, true, within North America, people like to explain them away, but the demons and the devil are quite real. They're very real. We have a tendency to overlook that. But more importantly for us, as we hear this passage and how Christ is not only the one who is able to cast out demons, we have this wonderful association and connection here that is tied to us as well, and the importance of baptism and using our baptism, which, again, if you view baptism in the way that so many denominations and preachers do today as just a symbolic thing where you show God and you commit your life to Jesus and all of these kinds of things, rather than the way that Scripture presents it, because Scripture never teaches baptism as a sign, as something that we do. Baptism is always taught as the thing where which Christ has commanded, he comes to us in order to clothe us in himself, in order to take away our sins, in order to give us his Holy Spirit, in order to come and to dwell in our lives by faith and to build us together into one new family as members of that body of Christ by God's working. Here's the wonderful thing about baptism, because in that same understanding, right from the early church, every baptism has really been understood to be an exorcism. You say, what? How could that be? Well, it's because through baptism we're joined with our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, together with our Heavenly Father, but always through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the blood that spilled from his side, and the water that spilled from his side, those two sacraments. Well, through that water, he makes us to be temples of God and temples of the Holy Spirit, as Paul writes. Or the way that we heard several weeks ago from, well, the book of Ephesians and that whole baptismal context of what he's talking about in relationship to the life of the church, where we are brought to be one family, taking away that wall of hostility where we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any one of us should boast, where Christ comes to dwell in our hearts by faith. And if this Jesus, who tackled sin and death, and yes, even the devil himself by his, well, 40 days in the desert, and then yes, also here by casting out so many demons, has come through baptism to dwell in our hearts by faith so that we become that living temple built of so many living stones that he's brought together. What place is there for any demons in our lives? Sure, they might, well, try to bother us from the outside, but the way that Peter writes, they're nothing more than a roaring lion that's wandering around and prowling around to frighten us. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to trust in you. Help me to see that all of these things that, you know, we go through in church are not just symbolic rituals, but instead really the way in which you reach into my life, our life, to gather us together into one family, to bring the fullness of your Savior's work to bear on our lives one person at a time. So that rather than trying to always live in a DIY, do-it-yourself mentality, rooted in our old sinful self, we build on Christ, on Jesus, who has been given to us, who has gathered us, 
who has called us and washed us, who gives us his Holy Spirit to call us back to him, who becomes that working of faith in our lives so that even when we struggle, we can say, I believe, help my unbelief. All on the foundation of how Christ brings that faith into our lives through his word, through the waters of baptism, through that word and gift of forgiveness, and where he continues to feed us here at the altar. May the Lord help us in our struggles and our doubts to remove, remove all of the clouds of doubt that get in the way, but may he also strengthen us so that we would always bring ourselves, our concerns, our worries to him, to meet him in his body, the church, yes, in his word as he speaks to us, yes. And yes, then most importantly at the altar where he presents himself, body, spirit, humanity and divinity, in, with and under the bread and the wine in order to renew us in that gift of the cross, all for our life and for our salvation. Amen. As we continue, let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we continue our journey through the month of September, strengthen us within that lively awareness of what you have not only given and performed for us on the cross, but the way in which you've gathered us into that and given it to us in the waters of our baptism. Help us to recognize that even in the midst of you know, our worried hearts or social situations that we don't understand, that you have placed yourself right into the midst of our world in order not only to sustain us, but also to, to give us that cornerstone, that place from which we begin and build with your peace, your love and your grace every day. As we remember to make the sign of the cross, morning and evening and throughout the day, draw us always back to that new life that you have prepared for us and already anchored us in. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country as we not only face the fourth wave of COVID so that the, well, that DIY mentality wouldn't rule the day in how we approach what needs to be done in order to, to ensure the health of the whole of our country. Curb the, the temptation within the hearts of so many to try and fix their own lives through Dr. Google or their own ideas of what, what might be best. Instead, help them to trust the lead of the medical consensus within our country. Help also so that you would curb the temptation for for people to divide society based on masks or no masks and all of these other concerns that can become such a hot issue underneath the skin of so many. So that we would learn with humility not only to stand before you, crying out to you for your help during this time, not only in relationship to this disease, but also to the way in which the care unfolds, but also so that we would humbly be able to support one another and express your love in the way in which we look to the other around us to care for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with our country as we come into this last, last week of, of the elections and campaigns so that not only you would encourage and guide each and every citizen that's eligible to vote in order that they would cast their vote, not out of anger or out of fear, but out of a 
a sound mind, recognizing where we are and what needs to be done. Be also with all those who are campaigning, not only the leaders, but all those within each and every electoral jurisdiction so that they would focus their campaign on what is needful for our society at this time and avoid the temptation to, to fall into the kind of politicking that divides people from one another through, well, insults and all these kinds of things. We ask also that the government that is elected once the election day is all wrapped up, that that government would, no matter what shape it takes, would be able to leave behind ideological considerations to be able to focus more on what is necessary, not only for the care of our society and the citizens, but also so that as we take a look at what is needful for us in our economy, as well as looking at climate concerns and climate worries that we would be able to find an appropriate balance to be able to move forward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And all of these prayers and all of the other petitions of our hearts, we bring them before you, trusting in your mercy, all through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doing may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray together. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we turn our attention to our songs and our hymns for today. Let's begin with hymn 537. And we'll sing all the verses there. Um, beautiful Savior. It's actually a beautiful communion hymn where there's one additional verse which goes between verses 2 and 3, which for whatever reason isn't brought into the translations in most hymnals. But as we go through how beautiful our Savior is, that central verse reflects on how much more beautiful that Savior is as he comes to be present here among us for our use there at the supper on the altar in his body and blood. But let's join in singing, Beautiful Savior. Jesus shines brighter, 
Jesus shines purer than all the angels in the sky. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son adoration now and forevermore be thine. For our second hymn, let's turn to hymn 664. Fight the good fight, and we'll join in singing all four verses of that one. Pastor Oboya for helping us with singing in the back and, and Laura for playing for us today. Um, for our last hymn, it's another good oldie, Rock of Ages, 761. 761 in our hymnal. We'll join in singing all four verses. Let me hide my 
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.